7 o'clock, we have a continued public hearing, stormwater and site plan administrative review, common driveway, 16, 18 through 20, Man Hill Road. I move to accept the applicant's request to continue the public hearing for the stormwater special permit and common driveway site plan review for 16, 18, and 20 until March 26, 2020 at 7 p.m. And to continue the time for action for filing with the town clerk until April 13, 2020. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Aye. you. All right, now we have um, design review committee interview. At 7.02. Christopher, I take it. Christopher Coogan? Yes. <laughs> Come on on up. Welcome. Identify yourself where you live and give us a rundown. And why do you want to be a design review committee? Sure. Uh, my name is Christopher Coogan. I live at uh, 9 Newfield Road with my wife and two kids. Um, moved here just a couple of years ago. Um, we formerly um, lived in Hingham. We are New Englanders at heart, um, despite the fact being uh, born and raised um, in Providence, Rhode Island. So, um, <laughs> But most recently, we came back from Charleston, South Carolina, um, and we wanted to be back. Um, and um, we just love time for the cold weather. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, <laughs> water skiers enough skiers in our family. So, um, but I think um, that I threw my hat into the ring here because it was something I um, wanted to do. I wanted to get part and be part of um, the community here in Situate. Um, I've always preached to my wife um, that I ingrained myself in community. I was a province police officer, oddly enough. Um, <clears throat> I took a turn and um, worked my way into real estate uh, management after that, so um, upon my retirement. Um, two very different things, most would think, until you start dealing with people again um, and find out that what you're doing is managing expectations and um, um, personalities. So um, I certainly understand what it's like to sit in front of or um, slightly above people and listen to them um, wish upon something. So, um, but again, it, it was all about being part of the community, um, being able to give something back. Um, when we lived in Hingham, we spent more time in Situate, and that was probably because we didn't have kids and we were fond of TKO Malley's, but um, that's another story. Um, are, are you familiar with the Design Review Committee? Committee. I am. You are. Have you been to any of the meetings? I have not. You have not. And how do you feel that your background and experience will help the Design Review Committee? My first foray um, into um, management, real estate management in South Carolina was with land tech development and um, more specifically Southern Community Services. And we managed a um, property that um, based on size and population would have been about the 13th largest town in South Carolina. Um, and at that point, I was doing just this. I was the, I was the um, architectural review chairman. Um, I was the one who accepted the plans, made the recommendations, ran the meetings with the, um, <coughs> excuse me, with the um, architects, with the developers, and heard uh, the arguments of and uh, for um, the residents who were building in there. Or, I'm sorry, it wasn't just the residents either. It was also large commercial builders as well. Um, Bill? Yeah, looking through your, your work experience, if you, as I understand it, you've, you've, you've picked it up after it was already developed? Uh, it was in the, the middle. No, no, we weren't done. It's probably not done now. Um, uh, Park West down in, uh, Charles, uh, sorry, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Because you left? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite a large job, but um, uh, I would say I came in at 75% completion, maybe, maybe a little bit less. And um, my couple of years there, we got it up to um, roughly 90% completion. Um, but I think more land was, in fact, purchased that we knew was coming. So um, okay. this, uh, I left Mike Hurd, who was the general manager, the, the man above me, with um, 
um, a little bit more work to do. Okay, I'm all set. Patty? So are you familiar with our issues with our historic aspects of the town and how we're having problems with changing our historic aspects of the town? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with the issues that we have surrounding our historic elements in the town? No, not in the um, um, minutiae of these problems, but you know what you get from the ledger, what you get from Wicked Local, um, and what you see um, just from what you um, get, um, maybe having a coffee down at uh, Front Street and um, between listening and talking to uh, others, what they're going through, who's going through what, maybe even at a soccer game with uh, my daughter. They didn't find out. Um, so you've been around here for a while since you were in Higgum. You told us you were here a lot. Yes. Um, one of my concerns is that we're losing our um, quaintness in the town of Cinchwood, that we're losing to these big developments. So I, my interest would be how do you maintain that historical aspect when you're going into these large projects that we have undertaken in the town, such as Toll Brothers, for example, or even. Um, um, on Drip Lane, the new project that's going to be developed there, or on Country Way? I think you have to put conditions upon the development itself, um, and that has to be to conform. Um, you know, growth for the sake of growth is, um, and I, I hope I'm not insulting anybody, but growth for the sake of growth is usually just a money grab. Um, but if it's done properly, um, with the idea of being sustainable, with the idea of fitting into an already established community, um, then you could really achieve something good. And that's why we chose Situate, because it is your quintessential, or should be, your quintessential Massachusetts, New England, seacoast town. Okay. Steve. Uh, yeah, maybe you could, uh, I'm intrigued by this, uh, Mount Pleasant work that you did. Um, can you kind of explain the the role? It sounds like you were um, reviewing submittals from developers um, yes. for master communities, and mm -hmm. what was the what <coughs> what were the standards of review and all of that? Was that something that was created um, in regulation, or uh, how, how was that approached? I'm was, not sure I understand it. <coughs> sure, it was. Um the first um, wave of <coughs> um, the first wave of <coughs> development had to pass town ordinance first, and it had to be. <coughs> but we were a master development. We had a master community association, mm -hmm. which had its architectural review guidelines that had to be met. And like oh, I get it now. Like so, here, mm -hmm. you want that coastal, you want that situate feel mm -hmm. down there. It was that southern feel. Mm -hmm. You had to have, down to the um, detail of the proper shutter dogs are on your shutters. Mm -hmm. um, so the master, the, you work for the master developer and sort of implementing their design criteria then, basically. Yeah, and coming aboard um, when I did, it was already developed, so I was more or less enforcing. I was taking the applications, I was taking the blueprints, mm -hmm. um, I was marking them up and having them ready for um, our uh, mm -hmm. weekly reviews. Mm -hmm. and, and in those kinds of circumstances, can you give me just sort of an example of how you <coughs> ran into a maybe a controversial um, development and how it, how, how it got addressed and how yeah, you the, helped uh, address it? Sure. The, um, um, CFO of uh, what's the pizza place Uno um, Uno Pizzeria mm -hmm. whichever one yeah. the CFO was a French gentleman um, who was developing on Park Island Park Island was actually um, gated closed off the only way on and off the island was a bridge and the criteria there was usually three million dollars mm -hmm. um, minimum uh, with that, they had the same guidelines as we do in the master development as well. Uh, his first submission came over, and it was state of the art. It was as modern as the Guggenheim, and um, and maybe something you guys know about over there. I guess that's Third Cliff. Um, oh, the cement building. Yeah, exactly. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's some you know an awful lot of glass. Um, 
an awful lot of steel. Uh, very, um, very Superman-esque. Uh, you know, it was not, um, uh, not conformant. And we went around it, and we had to keep going back and forth. And usually it was through and, and, and against their attorneys mm -hmm. until you know, they said, this is why, you know, hopefully you pick a community like this because you understand what the criteria is and what the expectation. Mm -hmm. um, and once you settle that, then you move forward. They didn't. They didn't want to accept it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was best for them to move on. Mm -hmm. so. Interesting. Stan. Um, I guess uh, ha having visited and, and lived in, in situ now for a while, um, obviously you've noticed there's a lot of growth and development and change going on, like in most of eastern Massachusetts and New England. Um, what, in your opinion, I guess from having reviewed kind of like the charge and the roles of the design review committee, what are some developments or projects going on in town now that you um, kind of think of could have been done a little bit better from a design review perspective and also what are ones that you um, think were done well and that you kind of are fully on board with how it went? Uh, I would go to the Toll House, uh, the to Toll uh, Brothers um, development. Um, I'd like to see, um, I would like to have seen what their submissions were, what their expectations, and what they were asked for. Um, at first blush, I think it's too much, uh, particularly when um, you have issues down in that area, such as the Brown Water. Um, so the... Um, pressure um, and usage put on the system um, in an area like that is only going to worsen, I would imagine. Uh, I don't think it's going to get any better. Um, so that um, that's one. Um, I'd like to flip it a bit because, and I'll be very honest with you, I don't think I can effectively answer the question. So I'd like to flip it a bit and say what I'd like to do or see out of North Situate and how that should be made um, and developed in a manner that should be more welcoming, that should be more um, family-oriented, walking-oriented. There's parking there now. There's, um, um, you know, the, how about keeping the people coming off the trains um, there? Maybe, you know, even if it's only a Thursday or Friday night, for um, a you know, quick cocktail or something. Uh, maybe there is a restaurant there in which they can go. Um, maybe we could do something with that trip one where the um, new uh, dribbles is, um, and, and then the gym over there. That's um, an eyesore, but viable business are, uh, businesses are in there. Um, that's the kind of, and, and North Situate is maybe, the, a lot of people come to these, and I'll, I'll admit, a lot of people come and ask to be part of something like this because they have their own personal agenda. And one of them for me would in fact be, Let's do something better with North Situate. Um, that that'd be that'd be one thing that helped um, push me and motivate me to throw my hat in the ring. Um, so, not an effective question. Uh, I'm sorry, answer, but um, no, that, that's um, hopefully it gets through what I'm hoping for and um, what I would like to do um, and see done. Thanks. Good. Have you been to any of the meetings that have been held in regards to uh, North Situate yet? I have not. Um, my lesson came from getting tires done, so I don't think I have to explain yeah. where I was. <laughs> um, and a friendship with a uh, business owner. Uh, my wife's a friend with a business owner um, also there. Um, so um, a lot has come with, um, you know, uh, you know yeah, a little, little contact um, just right around the dinner table or, like I said, having um, uh, some tires put on. So. Thank you. All right. Do you have any questions for us? Uh, I do not. I, um, I just want to thank everybody again for giving me a second opportunity. I, I do apologize not being able to make the first uh, meeting. Um, um, I was happy to get a chance. So um, thank you. And You're um, I appreciate your time. And thank, yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for putting your hand up, too. Yes. Uh, well, I do have a question. And I'm sorry if, if I could go, please, uh, if I please could go back. Would there, is there a time frame when you do, um, we'll make a decision? I think we will probably make a decision. Hopefully later tonight. Later tonight. <laughs> yeah. 
later tonight. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. We now have an informal discussion for the P.J. Steverman inline skate rink. Hi, my name is Anna Shea, um, 138 Hollett Street. Um, so I am here. I have been to a few CPC meetings. Um, you guys can see the application in front of you is for the PJ Steven inline rink. I'm trying to get it repaired back to usable condition. Um, right now it's not in the greatest condition. So Mrs. Burbine suggested that I come and talk to you guys and just kind of answer any questions that you have or comments anything like that um, I included pictures there and the application that I, I resubmitted with a little bit more money um, our plan right now is to donate the ten thousand dollars to a maintenance fund to in order to upkeep the rink after the work's done if it's if it goes for approval so and I asked Anna to come in um, as you know I'm on CPC as the liaison from <coughs> planning just so that everybody knows what's going on I mean, I'm a big believer in letting people know what's happening and basically if I understand this correctly mm -hmm. other than revamping the rink yep nothing is changing no there's no additional parking there's no everything's anything. the same everything mm -hmm. is exactly exactly the same right except it will be Sparkly new. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's hopefully what my the plan is. Yeah. Okay. So I'll <laughs> open it up to the board. Any questions? Uh, yeah, I I've, I've got a question. Sure. Um, it looks like it's in quite the disrepair, and and I've seen it before, having used the crumbling tennis courts over there too. Yeah. But um, um, who owns this rink? Is this um, school? So, so we gifted it to the town in 1996 um, in the memory of my brother. His yep. search ended um, in April, and we did our last fundraiser in March. So with mm -hmm. all the funds that we had left over, we made the so rink and it's then gifted town it to the town. So it's property. town owned. Yep. Yep. And um, the town's responsible for maintaining it? That's correct, yeah. That's how it was. I, I don't have the minutes, mm -hmm. and I was only 15 when we built it, so I don't really know the details. But um, I, I talked to Joe Norton, and I just talked to a few people that were, you know, in the game then, and mm -hmm. and they said that yeah, that was part of the part of the deal. And when I called over to CPC, uh, not to CPC, to DPW to start inquiring about this because I really didn't know where to start, um, mm -hmm. they had said that they think it's in the plan. But then just by looking at it, mm -hmm. I don't think I think it's just been. Yeah, yes. I, I, you know, what concerns <laughs> me is that um, it doesn't look like it's gotten a heck of a lot of maintenance, right? right? And right. even if we restore it, like, who's, is anybody going to take responsibility for maintaining so this? So the $10,000 is going to a fund in at the town that mm -hmm. is going to be used to maintain the rank, whether it's the DPW that maintains it or an outside mm -hmm. contractor. I imagine that it's not going to take too much maintenance because once it's done, um, you know, I think maybe the crack in the surface had to do with just not weed whacking it mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean? Just yeah. over time, frost, things like that. Um, so the surface that I actually looked into is tiles. Mm -hmm. So when there's a crack or something like that, you only have to replace the tiles, not the whole surface. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, cuts down on the cost quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's the plan so far. Rebecca? Mm -hmm. How, when did you guys, when was this built? In 1996. Okay, so it's yeah. been a or while. Or actually 97, because he was found in 96, so we started 97, so it would have been 97. 22 yeah. years, right? Yeah. 23 years. And so the, there's an application, is that different from the $10,000, the application? Yes. Have so the $10,000. So $10,000 is just for maintenance. Yeah, so you just don't have list. everything in front of me, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so in that packet there's a list. It just says a list of donations that we've made, and it's yeah. we go through the, we have, we're, the Friends of Citrate Recreation. We support recreation yep, yep. activities with all the money that we've raised in his memory. Okay. Um, and I just actually recently started a hockey tournament last year. Yep. Um, we stopped the golf tournament four years ago, so I started the hockey tournament. Um, 
and it was a success. I raised fifteen thousand dollars, and hopefully this year we'll raise another twenty-five as my goal. So, <laughs> and that's happening in May. So all that money is going to go towards any future, you know, needs. future needs. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Yep. Okay. Well, I suspect you're right. Is that it's taken. You know, a years of neglect so that you get to a place where you have to do capital repairs. Well, I repairs. came up with my kids to teach mm -hmm. one of them how to ride a bike. And I was, like, floored. Mm -hmm. Because I just hadn't been up here. It just my right. kids, you know, just started riding bikes. And they just, you know, so I was really shocked mm -hmm. at the condition. And that's what kind of, like, put the fire under me to get going. Okay. Cool. So, yeah. All right. Um, yes. I, I just wanted to just identify, mention. please, identify yourself. Oh, Linda Steverman, 228 Beaver Dam Road. <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to say that through the golf tournament about 10 years ago, it was in need of some major repairs. Mm. And with the money that we had raised that year, we were able to resurface it and paint it and do all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but as Anna said, as you can see now, that it lasted 10 years. Yeah. Okay. And, um, is, is there a great. standard set of sort of maintenance requirements that need to be done no, every I, year? You know, I, I think it's like anything. And if it's, let's say, for 24 years, and nothing's done besides paint, that kind mm -hmm. of thing, they, it's wood. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the mm -hmm. boards of wood, they, they fall apart. Mm -hmm. And it's had a lot of use, mm -hmm. thankfully. Mm -hmm. well, that's so good. I, I, you know, it's one thing if it sits there and falls apart when nobody uses it, but the reason it's falling apart is because it is so well used. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Ben? Um, What's the estimated total cost for the renovations? Um, three, I put 315 to be safe because when I got my quotes, I didn't get them uh, prevailing wage. Okay. So I just added the 33% onto it, and that's what I came up with, yeah. Okay, so 315000 yeah. just to clarify. Okay. Yep. And do you have any figures on the uh, current like usage or projected future usage of the um, In terms of... Just um, like who uses it? Yeah, I guess generally, like I, because for full disclosure, when I grew up, it was when it was built. And yeah, like, I know that we played a lot of floor or like yeah. roller hockey and stuff out there. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I'm so far removed from that. I don't know how many kids are coming. Yeah, and going so these days, um, how many people are using? So it. according to Mara at Recreation, it's the most used facility that we have. From a so recreation like, from a recreation okay. perspective, hmm. we have um, it's the hockey tournament uses. I mean, the hockey team uses it for their first tryouts I guess that's a tradition um, the lacrosse team uses it when the snow on the field they'll shovel it and use it just for like dry land kind of thing uh, the gym classes use it all there's just a whole mix of people um, I know the Donatos use it to put on like a hockey clinic in the summer um, and I feel like if it was in better shape we could probably use it in for profitability I mean right. the recreation department could put on we used to do an all sports festival over there and it was a great money maker, you know. It was a, they used it for a fundraiser. So um, there's, there's a lot of kids in the afternoon on. Mm -hmm. I would say after okay. school. Yeah, and just in that area, like with the basketball courts and the skate park and all that stuff, they're just, you know, everywhere. Yeah. So okay, yeah. Bill, what are you looking for us? Looking. I'm just looking to for support. Yeah, just for support and to be able to answer any questions that you had and suggestions or. Welcome. <laughs> I'm new to this, so. <laughs> You're doing very well. Thank you. The fact that you've sort of identified and have some funding for maintenance, I think, is huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because we run into this all the time where they just keep getting worse and worse until you have to right. spend a million dollars instead yes. of $10,000. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, think that's, I think that's very impressive. It is. Mm -hmm. yeah, I Who's going to make sure that that ten thousand dollars goes to where it's supposed to go? I mean, who, right? You know, so we have this problem with fields, and who's supposed to take care of stuff? So uh, you have an identified amount of money, but we don't have an identified gatekeeper, so to speak. Um, I think it's the DPW. Uh, I believe, yeah, when I went to the selectmen's meeting, that's what they said, and they suggested to put the money aside. Um, the town holds the money, and they do what they do with the money. So you write a check to the town. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I donate the money to the town to this fund that's only for PJ's rank and will only be used for PJ's rank. So, so they, they have a budget? dedicated fund? 
Yeah. So we have That's to make what sure. they would I mean, do. We, we should make sure. Yeah. 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 It's a separate fund. Right. Too yeah. easy for yeah. it to end up in I, the general I, I fund. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's that's my question. Yeah. Is to make yeah. sure. They that said that they would keep it in like a separate. And I think Nancy Hall is usually right on top of that. Okay. So I don't think that that's anything that we need to be concerned about. And because you'll be using it more and more, right? You will be more cognizant of what needs to be done. Right. So. Exactly. And you are looking for a letter from uh, support from us. How do you all feel about that? Can we great. support this? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay. Thank you, so great. Mm -hmm. You're all set. I, all I right. Would, thank you. I very would much also for say we ought to support it. the notion of a maintenance of a dedicated maintenance right. fund yep. for absolutely. the rink only. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. As part of our uh, letter of support. Great. Okay. We want to make thank sure that I gets appreciate done. your time. Yep. Well, we appreciate you coming in. Good job, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> you get this Thank one you. done, we'll give you another one. <laughs> Thank you. All right, our next item is an informal discussion with the Historical Commission. Doug Smith. Yes, good evening. Good evening. How are we doing tonight? We are quite well. So if you will just identify yourself for the record. Yes, my name is Doug Smith. I'm the chairman of the Situate Historical Commission. Thank you. All right, we are here to talk about um, historic preservation policy. Yes. Because we have issues that people come in and they want to have a building for the public good or whatever, and then it turns out to be not what we had thought it would be. Correct. So, a case in point, 90 and vinyl. Yes. So, what are your thoughts on all of this? So, in an informal discussion with Karen, um, you know, we were talking about uh, what makes something historic. So, and what does preservation of a historic structure look like? So, that kind of gets widely interpreted, I think, by anybody who's applying for a special permit. Mm -hmm. And I just think if we take an opportunity to think about it, we may be able to bring some structure and guidance to it. So if someone was applying for a special permit and they felt that historic preservation was a piece of the special permit, the reason for granting it, you could set some sort of guardrails and guidelines uh, so the person getting that special permit would know exactly what they're required to do mm -hmm. in order to maintain the historic preservation and therefore benefit the public by doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at times, um, again, it kind of gets widely interpreted as to what is still historic. Is it a complete restoration of a building? Is it a renovation of a building? Is it just keeping the frame of the building and building around it? You know, there's a lot of sort of ways people look at that and what we were sort of proposing and it's just really a first stab it's a draft and I really welcome the discussion is that if you had to follow the guidelines and standards of a house if it was on the National Register of Historic Places that's a pretty high bar it gets into the use of materials it gets into craftsmanship and workmanship and that would clearly identify to the person getting the special permit what was expected but it is a very high bar. Karen, do you have anything that you want to add or could add to this? Um, when you guys first talked about the policy after Doug had made some suggestions, you seemed to want it a little mm -hmm. bit stronger in terms of how you actually, you know, review at a building mm -hmm. permit time, review at an occupancy permit time to make sure that actually if they're following the guidelines um, and for a national register they would be you know quite steep that it was all followed through and it's not and they're following through all the way so thus I wrote based on Doug's first uh, pass at the at a policy um, I reinforced that with um, stuff for for checking in with um, historic, with the building permit, hiring a specialist, etc., all the applicants' um, expense. Okay. Have you seen these drafts? I have. Yep. Um, Karen sent them to me. I have not had an opportunity to review it with the historical commission, 
we haven't met since this was sent to us. So I think I would like that opportunity before you take a final vote on it to kind of run it by them to get their thoughts, to get their input. But I'm welcome to any uh, suggestions. You know, on both of them, I went through them. Uh, you know, a couple, a couple of just minor issues is that um, in some areas we refer to the term districts. Situa does not have any formal historic districts in town, either a national register or local, so you might want to take that out just for a point of clarity. Yeah, I think there's some language yeah. uh, modifications, some of which, Karen, I mentioned I sent to you um, this evening, so nobody's had a chance to see it yet. Yeah. But in terms of the general approach, and maybe that would be good to just sure. describe, right? The, I think that the concept is somebody who is proposing historic preservation as a public benefit for permit yeah. should be required to provide a certain amount of information with that permit. That's kind of where we were last time is that, you know, let's, let's say what needs to be submitted as a minimum for, um, to consider that as a potential public benefit. So I, I think that's a good first step, yeah. right? It's really on the proponent to propose something to, and there's a list of things that I think Karen's outlined here, photographs, um, what else? Uh, description of the existing structure, and, the, and I say the historical significance, information from the Mass Cultural Research Information Center, a narrative, and I would say detailed description of the proposed work. All of that should be sort of part of the submittal as, as an initial step because we don't want to be guessing at what the proponent's proposing to do. Um, I think then what we're proposing is to send that to you, to sure. your commission, um, along with to the board members for initial review prior to, in, in my view, prior to the first public meeting. Yeah, okay. I think you want to make sure what someone's proposing as historic actually is. Yeah, and we yeah, would, want, want, verify that. We would yeah. want your opinion before we even had Absolutely. the first public meeting that's kind of how how I think we should develop this and, and I think that's just pretty much how Karen's laid it out right and then it gets to sort of this point of okay um, what needs to be done to sort of finalize this yep. and I think there's there's a notion that there needs to be some kind of third-party evaluation this is where I got a little confused Karen on, on how things were laid out is the intent that um, once they've submitted it and we've gotten comments back that we then go to a third party like peer review? Is, is that what you're saying? Or is this consultant that you're talking about the consultant that the, that the proponent hires? I'm, I'm trying to follow the sort of description. I don't want to get too detailed, but just the process. Um, is. Or is that something that they, we would expect them to submit as part of the initial submittal? No, I think after, after we've talked to determine mm -hmm. if it's going to really need, if it really has historic potential historic benefit. Then, then they have to do a full workup on it, basically. Okay. And, and would that be, um, that would be a full workup they submitted that we then review sort of as a peer review? Do we need a peer review or is that something that just gets reviewed um, by the Historic Commission and the Planning Board, obviously, but. I think it's a great question. Uh -huh. um, sometimes <clears throat> when somebody would say how they're going to do a restoration or renovation, you really start getting into, you know, roof angles and slopes, or they might say they want to add a dormer or mm -hmm. something like that. So sort of what looks like something on a sketch when you actually measure it out. Mm -hmm. And really verify it and look at roof angles and things like that it could be dramatically kind of different mm -hmm. sort of what you see in the sketch and what would actually be done in a restoration or renovation process so that was sort of the example with the weatherby house when um that was the an frontier. evaluation done before the renovation though correct right, right. after yeah. you approved the project but after you approved the project, the project yeah. did we the town picked the consultant on yeah. that one. Right. Yeah. Right. So I have a feeling that the town wants to be uh, telling them who to use for a historical preservation consultant, 
to or I mean, you I, could recommend or something like that, but I think it would be to the proponent's responsibility to find the right person and then okay right. And, you know, and if submit we had a plan, right? On it, yeah. And, and then the, the question, it. once that plan submitted, is I'm sure I would be unqualified yeah. <laughs> to review that plan, right? right. So right. we would then need either a peer review or to rely on the historic commission to provide that Probably review. Probably need a peer review for the, depending on the project, though. Yeah. You I know, mean, if it's simple enough, maybe. If it's simple enough, right. Yeah. If somebody's just saying that we're going to keep it exactly as it is, maybe mm -hmm. we want to. Move it 20 feet to create access or some reason like that, then you, you could do that. So, right. I mean, that's, and that's something that you could give us sort of input on as yeah. to whether that could seems be, right or not. It could be not. a point that it's beyond. Yeah. You know, if somebody's, <clears throat> for example, the Weatherby House was a historic replication mm -hmm. almost. Right. You know, it was really, you know, right. measurements and size of windows and trim and mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. but just not using the original, original materials. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. So you're going to request that they use original materials? Well, if they went to the level that um, the National Register of Historic Places uses, it would be, you know, it would be certain materials that can be used and not be used. So if the house originally had cedar shingles, they'd probably have to go back to cedar shingles instead of asphalt. Um, but they wouldn't have to go back and find 1740 no, no, cedar no, no, shingles. No, 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 no. It'd have to be wood <laughs> instead of, <laughs> that, wood instead of, of you know, products. aluminum siding or, you know, things like right, that. Okay. So Because there's just products out there that are... That, yeah, they're actually... That's a lot longer in this area than maybe the original ones. That's right. You know, one of the big uh, discussions on historic properties is windows, right? Fenestration. So, you know, you could do a replacement window that would not have a storm window and looks kind of nice, but the glass is kind of thick, but... In the historic preservation world, they say a storm window is actually a more sympathetic treatment. Know, yeah. Treatment, but mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in this stuff. I'm, I pay attention to this, and I'd rather have the other windows. But that's kind of how it goes. But Sitchwick does not have any really stringent historic regulations or guidelines. There's a demolition review bylaw, but that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no historic districts. There's no. There's nothing like that. There's a lot of homes that are on the National Register of Historic Places. But there are really no protections. There's no, um, you know, areas of town that are considered a local historic district which have those really stringent regulations. Mm -hmm. There's two types of districts. There's national register districts and local historic districts. Believe it or not, the local historic districts are much more stringent okay. than national register districts. So, so the like center of Norwell, yeah, the center of Norwell is a national register district. Hingham has several local historic districts. So there's a difference. Years ago, uh, they tried here in Situate to put in a historic district down on a part of Stockbridge Road, that area. And <coughs> mm -hmm. There just wasn't enough historic yeah. houses there to warrant. Yeah. Sometimes, I mean, you could draw one house as a historic district if you wanted to. You could do that. You know, the t uh, Nantucket, the entire island's a historic district. Mm -hmm. So... There's different ways to do it, but some, in some ways, you know, national register districts, it gives the perception of protection more than the actual. But it was very helpful to Hingham when they restored the Greenbush Rail because the national register district or national register property sure. triggers Section 106, mm -hmm. which is a federal requirement saying that you right. cannot do any adverse harm to anything historic uh, when you're using federal funds. So they did have an advantage there. Well, we had it in North Situate as well. Right. So That's we why they had to inventory all those properties and say within 600 feet of the tracks, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And that, um, so the standard that we're talking about of the National Historic Places, the, the, the preservation guidelines from the Secretary of Interior. Yep. Um, in your view, is that sort of a hard and fast set of guidelines, or well, that's there... something you could think about. You know, yeah. that could be the standard. But I, th I think whatever you do is, you want to be certain that if somebody's proposing something that's going to be to the public benefit for mm -hmm. historic, you know, that sort of what goes in comes out. You know, so it really is yeah. because I just think it's too kind of loose right now, and it's open to a lot of interpretation. Yeah. And I'm not sure it serves anyone well. 
No, know, I agree. I'm not, sure, I, I, I'm I not think sure it serves. It's a balance, yeah. though, right? Because if we're going to set this up and say this is what we expect you to follow, I mean, for somebody who's doing it, you want to give them sort of clear guidelines on what we're expecting as well. Right. So that they're not shooting at a moving target either, right? Correct. So that's why I ask about these particular guidelines. If that's the guideline, and, you know, maybe we could yeah. waive some of those guidelines as we go through it, um, but that's what people should um, – you should aspire yeah. to, if you right. will. <laughs> I, I think you probably want something like that because if you make the guidelines so stringent, people might say, well, why bother? But then they might lose their opportunity to get a special permit, too. Right, right. So well, they, they would you lose the opportunity to claim historic preservation yeah. as a public benefit right. in a special permit. Right. There are other public benefits, sure. right? So, yeah, it could uh, be recreation or trails or whatever. Yeah, so, so it's something to think about or at the discretion of the planning board or... Uh -huh. There could be some, yeah. You know, there's some things we just don't anticipate, right? Yeah. Um, Bill, do you have anything? Yeah. Else? What about timing? Going through these processes. Yeah, I mean, I think you want it. You don't want it to be too cumbersome that it can't. Um, I think you put a 21-day review for the historical commission to get back to the planning board, yep. so that's fairly tight. I guess the question would be, you know, if somebody had to hire a consultant or something, how long that would take. Yeah. Yeah, because time is the money. Of these guys it sure is. Or those yeah. guys, them. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mine is a more philosophical question. Is sure. I don't think. Do you think that our bar is high enough, or it doesn't even exist? Right now. Yes. I, I don't believe it exists. That's just my opinion because I think when you say, you'd have to give me an example of one of your special permits, but how it's written, it just says you know, we'll preserve the house at whatever and vinyl road Not enough guidelines. there was no guidelines or you know there was guidelines were interpreted in all the intention yeah. might have been positive but in the end we <coughs> yeah, we did. i think that's why we need to get stuff in well, writing yeah. right, <laughs> right. Yeah. and yeah. integrated into the yeah. permit the, right. the weatherby house seemed to be a much more stringent yes. writing and in the end i mean the original intent was to try to preserve the house but when the applicants, I know when they came to the Historical Commission, they said, you know, we're kind of in a bind here because the original house was built as a residential property. Part of it is now commercial, so it can't even handle the floor loads of a commercial building, so now we're right. really stuck. Right. So they felt their only option was a replication. So the other question that would be is, why do we not have any historic districts? So I know three right in town that I would consider to yeah. be what I know. So we have them identified. We've actually identified about 14. Um, and it's a process of whether it be a local historic district or a national register district. Mm -hmm. I think the philosophy with the Historical Commission, which has only been around since about 2006, you have to remember that, has been that the pursuit of a national register district is probably an easier avenue, does provide some perceptions of protection. And... Um, would still serve the same purpose, that people would know when they're entering a certain area that this is an area of historical significance. Mm -hmm. Part of that is it's a cost mm -hmm. to submit those applications. It's a cost to process them and get them approved. It's a fairly lengthy process. So the charge that the Historical Commission has really been under is inventorying. So if you go to the MACRIS site, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yes, you did, yeah. Were you there today and you saw all the houses? I mean, that's a lot of work. So we have to sort of do our inventory. We have to get all the pieces in place before you start assembling districts to do that work. So I think the town has just really just been late to the game in doing that. I agree. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay. Um, ben? Um, I don't have anything specific on the draft policy. I think just in general I'm in full support of this. Um, as it applies to the public historical review for public the public be benefit option, option on special permits. But mm -hmm. I'm reflecting on all of this and hearing what's being said tonight. I'm also in full support of really putting some teeth into our zoning bylaw for all historic houses or whether that's establishing districts or some sort of, like you said, right now in your opinion, there's no bar. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to set some bar and decide what level of conservatism we want to have. But I think um, I would be in full support of even thinking about how we integrate this into our overall zoning and planning initiatives um, long term. It's not just as it applies to this special permit thing, but kind of branching out. Because I think 
I mean, I had Mrs. Laidlaw, you know, growing up <laughs> as a kid in school, and I think that people, new, new residents come, or even when we live here for a long time, we go on with our lives, we forget that we live in one of the oldest towns in the country, and, um, you know, and there's a lot of other places in New England where the historical aspect is a big draw for people, and it's a source of pride, it's a source of... Uh, revenue through tourism, all sorts of things, and I think in Situate we have a like a strong group that keeps that going. But I think we really could mm -hmm. expand on that and try to do a better job. Not not that the historical commission and other groups yeah. aren't doing a good job; it's that we don't necessarily have the legal capacity through a bylaw or something to kind of force the issue. Yeah. Yep. Rebecca, I don't have any questions. Yeah. My biggest concern is once, and I agree with everything that has been said here this yep. evening, that we do me need to make this really legitimate mm -hmm. so that it's a, a, people can follow it. It's the follow through, that once they receive the permit, once we yep. have to have someone to keep an eye on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna defer to you guys on that. I Thank mean, the commission is right. happy to partner with you happy to do whatever we can to assist that process, but special I think that falls, I, 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 I would think that would fall to the similar, inspector. well, no, I would think it would fall similar to what we do with like stormwater review. Like we have a peer review who does field visits, right? So why wouldn't we ask the applicant if, if they're basing their, their permit on providing this public benefit, why wouldn't we ask the applicant to provide some funding to allow us to do that mm -hmm. ongoing review. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right. It would seem pretty natural to me. Okay. Um, and, and it wouldn't then place a burden on the historic commission or even on, well, other than the planning department has to manage the, the right. consultant, if you will, but, um, you know, it, would, it wouldn't place a burden on others right. to, to have to sort of fill in on that role. Rebecca? I was just going to say, if we did have better guidelines in place, it would, you know, obviously I think having somebody oversee it is a great idea, but also guidelines will be really helpful. Really? Okay. Yeah. So both. But really yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think it We're really eclectic in terms of our architecture out there. We really are. You know, we have a lot of I mean, really significant historic structures in time. We can all name them, right? But mm -hmm. there are a lot of, um, there was, yeah. Just because it's old doesn't always make it historic, too. So you look at age, you do look at architecture, but I think if you look at some of those forms that are done on macros, they call them Form Bs, if they're done well, there's a lot of detail that does try to identify the historic structure or who built it and some of the original photographs. I think what happens, too, is over time, you know, houses get changed, houses get modified, things happen, so... But I know at DRC, when they, they've looked at it, sat there and said, well, we've got a, a dormer here. Yeah. Is that, is that really with the time period and the, you really don't know? A lot of folks were doing what they wanted to do, you know, back in the day. So, I mean, there's a pretty big collection of center chimney capes that are fairly old yeah. and are pretty significant. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a lot of Victorian architecture, but you can go through the different years. A good example is... Um, you know, 545 Country Way that Frank Snow did. I mean, he picked yeah. a period that he wanted to restore it to, and it yeah. looks great, you know, so Stunning. it really is. Any comments from the public? Yes. Andrea, 166 Mail Lot Road. Um, what we're discussing here is mostly people who are coming in, your proponent that you're speaking of, and asking for a special permit to preserve. And I can understand how that can happen. I think that for me, as a situate resident and seeing what is happening to some of the very special areas that we have in this town, I would also like to see, as Ben suggested, some type of a district so that the town itself, even the town-owned property, could do something to protect our area. There was a lot of arguing and discussion about the National Historic Areas um, around the Old Gate School, the Lawson Tower, the Unitarian Church, um, and that whole area. And yet, 
when those issues were brought up and Lyle Nyberg went through Gates School and identified several things and talked about getting that on the registry, um, it was kind of dismissed and none of the rules and regulations that the registry puts out for a historic district, even though it was said to be of historic significance, none of the rules and regulations for that were followed in the planning of the, of the senior center. And um, it's kind of a shame that the town is not held to the same standard that we might hold a proponent who's coming in for a preservation. We need to have a standard to do something to save our historic areas so that they're not encroached upon with, with large buildings that don't fit, fit the mm -hmm. area. Thank that's, you. That's just I would suspect that would take a zoning change. I don't, I don't think it's anything we could do. No, it, it would but we can dev definitely do it sort of project by project by setting up a policy here. But it's not having a district like that. You're at a point where if anybody ever sold the Gates School and wanted to put in senior housing in there, um, and that land was sold, they could they could go in and do anything because we don't have any rules or regulations to stop that. Yeah, I think that was the point I was making is that we can't do that. That has to be a town meeting vote That's to right. create a special district or special districts for those kinds of things, exactly. which I would, I would yeah. probably defer back to the historic commission to create those. <laughs> so, so, so a national, interestingly, a national register district does not need a town meeting vote. Mm -hmm. okay. That's actually kind of a direct application to the Secretary of the Interior. A local historic district would need a local town mm -hmm. meeting vote, and it would create the creation of a local historic district commission that mm -hmm. would have to establish the guidelines as to what, yeah. you know, uh, which can uh, be uh, pretty stringent. Back to so, that, yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. those are your two options. Well, it, I think it would make sense for you to review our latest version of yes. this and yep. get, get your feedback. We'll do that, that fairly quickly because yeah. we're meeting again on the 30th. So we'll go through it. We'll come back with recommendations, yeah. another draft back. and we'll the, the only together. thing I would sort of highlight here is that in, in places we talk about the building commissioner and the historic commission sort of doing things mm. um, or, or not issuing you know building permits or stuff. And I just think we might need to look at it in terms of at the end of the day, the planning board has to make a decision on a permit, and that decision may be conditioned upon right. those specific things, right? And then we would expect the building commissioner to live, you know, live with the conditions in the permit, right? Okay. Um, so, so I would just rewrite it a little bit that that we would make a decision and can condition the decision, and then we would expect that the building commissioner would follow the conditions in the permit. Because I don't think we can require him, you know, out of our policy to do this. We can do it on a permit by permit basis, right? Right. So I, that's the only other tweak I'd probably think about here. But we can do that after we get your comments. Sure. Yeah. So could I ask a question? So, yeah. Um, it seems that you're saying that, I mean, you want something tied to the building permit. You want ongoing inspections during construction. Mm-hmm. I was I was putting something in here, no occupancy permit, and then how do you guys feel about um, surety? Do you, I mean, I was requiring surety to make sure that I'm perfectly all, fine with that. Yeah. You know, um, just I mean, because this gets us into this condition we're in now, where somebody's mm -hmm. done a non-historic preservation to a historic property, right? Um, so. All right, so then I think if that's anybody fine. has any more comments, please get them back. We'll wait for the historic, then we'll meld yeah. them together, mm -hmm. and then we'll have it on the agenda again. Yeah. That would be great. I'm happy to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. How's, the, how's the demolition by low? Is that We've had some success with it. Um, we have had given people opportunities to sort of rethink some properties. Okay. Um, we've had a few folks who have said, okay, you know what, we can just form B the lot and keep the property historic and we'll build something new over yeah. here so we've had some wins with it you know it's it's usually a difficult um, you know people can wait it out if they want to um, but we've had a few folks reconsider and do something different yeah. so 
But we think because of the linkage, we may want to tweak that at the same time we're doing this one. Yeah. yeah. I think that the, sort of the, the uh, interesting thing here is this is a planning board policy, right? So it's not a regulation or anything right. else. Yeah. It's our policy. Yeah. So to Some the extent that yeah. we want to, we think it's appropriate to deviate from that policy for a particular reason, like right. the, the guidelines or anything. Yeah. We should have the latitude to do yeah. that, right? So I think that you know the demolition piece is sort of trying to do a prevention, yep. mm -hmm. where this is sort of an opportunity for somebody to maybe look at a property differently and say, "Hey, we could do something really great here, and that would help us get our permit." You know, and maybe that's where the you know the wisdom of the planning board, I would say, could say, "Wow, if they're really going to do a great job preserving this property for the public benefit, mm -hmm. then." You do whatever to grant the permit to go around whatever that particular yeah. There's so close there's on the zoning issue, you know. It's almost like a waiver. There's six or parking like spaces that. instead yeah. of eight, but you know we're preserving that house. So mm -hmm. I think that's really the that's the way you motivate people to do or you know, developers or whoever it may be. Yeah. That do they see an opportunity economically and? But we just want to make it. sure after all of that they actually do it. That's Correct. The, that's right. The point. Right. In the interpretation, the, the way that I we think, think it should be done. Right. Yeah, and I think that's really is the challenge. Yeah. The way we think it should be done, because I think there's some folks out there who probably thought they were doing the right thing. Uh, yeah. That's a matter of opinion. Could be right. Yes. Yeah, I'm Jennifer Kim, twenty Carrie Litchfield Lane. Um, I didn't get a handout, so I'm not really seeing what you guys are talking about. Do you have an extra copy? Well, no, not the agenda, but the proposed. No, I don't, don't have. Yeah. I can email it to her. Okay. We don't have it. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so thank much you for much coming in. Yep. Happy to we be will, here. Um, Appreciate it. Yeah. Get you'll get back to we'll us. Go back to you guys. And yep. we will work all of this out to hopefully everyone's satisfaction. Sounds great. Thank you thank for your you. time. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right. We have six. We have an hour. We have, no, we have a four minutes. Four, four minutes. minutes. That's okay. It's just slow. 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 Very slow. We have four minutes. Three minutes now. <laughs> well, by the time they get in here and set up, it'll be time. It is 8 o'clock. That clock is slow. So we'll, <coughs> we'll continue with our public hearing on Chief Justice Cushing Highway, 441 to 463. Mr. Morse, you're on. Thank you. I'm 
for the record, Gregory Moore, <coughs> engineer. And we're here with Benito. Attorney Ben, o ben O'Brien. Right, I'm Dave McCready. Uh, this is a continued hearing for the development of property on CJC Highway. Uh, we've been before, <coughs> I believe, three times with this plan. Since the last time, we've made two revisions to the plan. We've had a round of review comments with Merrill Associates. Uh, since the last set of plans, the changes that we made were to lots one and two. Uh, the building locations here were rotated. Uh, we increased the buffer on lots one and two, and actually all the lots, we increased the buffer. It used to be 20 feet along the back uh, between the development and the abutters. We've increased that now to a minimum of a 40 foot buffer along that entire lot line. Um, we've shortened the driveway on lots one and two uh, by approximately 50 feet. By reducing the driveway, it allowed us to pull the buildings forward. Um, the buildings were previously proposed 30 feet from the lot line. We now have them proposed at 65 feet. 20 is the requirement, so it greatly exceeds the requirement for setback. We made some revisions to the drainage system. The drainage system um, used to be more of an overland flow uh, into a rain garden system. We've now proposed on the pavement areas providing a Cape Cod berm and directing the water to a catch basin, a uh, deep sump footed catch basin, and then directing it into a four bay prior to the rain garden. At the lowest driveway on lot seven and eight, um, we have a catch basin into an oil particle separator and then into the rain garden, all complying with the minimum 90% TSS removal in accordance with the Water Resource Protection District. The septic system uh, was asked to be moved. The requirement, this is TAC Factory Pond, the requirement is that there be a 200 foot setback to any septic system. Um, we moved the system to be more than 400 feet away uh, to the TAC Factory Pond. So we've slid the septic systems up <coughs> gradient. Um, we've adjusted the site to accommodate the 400 foot setback. The claims went to Merrill Associates. Merrill Associates provided a comment letter um, last week. And we've, we've responded to that letter. The additional comments that were outstanding we believe we're all relatively minor in nature, but we made the revisions requested and submitted revised plans that we believe uh, should satisfy all of Merrill's outstanding comments. We've added inverts to the downspout leaders on the dry wells. We've added a table identifying on which lots the number of uh, infiltration chambers. 100% of the roof here is directed into subsurface recharge chambers. Uh, so we identified on a tabular format as well as on the plans the number of chambers on each lot. Uh, we've increased the sizes of the temporary construction basins during construction. Temporary stormwater basins would be constructed on the down gradient side of each of the three uh, common driveways. We've increased the size of those and included um, some additional detailing on how water will get there during the construction phase. And we added a note that all of the inverts in and out of the depressions would have flared end sections on them. And we added a Cape Cod firm detail, a standard detail per your regulations now that we've added that on the driveways. Um, we're, we're anxious to have this through its final review, hopefully, and uh, start talking about conditions. Karen? Um, so uh, they submitted a new set of plans earlier this week that has not been peer reviewed because it wasn't submitted with a week's uh, with proper time. Uh, two comments were received late today. Um, one was from the uh, Water Resource Commission and uh, the Water Resource Commission DPW and Water Department agree that while Tack Factory Pond has been classified as a tributary, it is a surface water and should be treated as such. Um, with that in mind, the Water Resource Committee would like to know the impervious covers of the dwellings and roof infiltration system that remain in the 400-foot area 
and move the proposed swale at the edge of lot eight um, out of the 400 foot area. Um, I believe we had we had some meetings with the applicant after the last meeting, and basically the board asked the applicant to move everything out of the 400 foot um, area, and mm -hmm. that has really not been done. You still have the lower infiltration system and uh, the two of the units in the 400 foot. I mean, technically there is only a 200 foot requirement, but you just have heard from the Water Resource Committee that they would like, you know, the 400. Um, uh, Robert Cheshire made a comment today. He'd like to know the results of the mounting analysis for the roof dry wells. Um, and they, he, he wants it submitted if it hasn't been submitted. And he said he was still waiting for answers to his previous questions. Those are the two that you, you just, right. everybody, we got those late um, today. We, we did have um, some photographs submitted from um, uh, uh, Mrs. Butler and I forwarded them to um, Mr. Morse, and I don't know of any um, resolution with the photographs. There was water sitting at the surface of uh, several areas on site, and Mr. Morse, I forwarded that information and the contact information. I don't know if that's been followed up on. I did speak with Mrs. Uh, Butler about the photos that were submitted. My first request was back to the planning department. I did not receive a response, and that was I wanted to know where the photos were taken. Um, because I was sent photos of water on the ground. I was sent photos of puddles, essentially. Um, in speaking with Mrs. Butler, I was told that the photos were taken toward the bottom of the hill on the opposite side of the stone wall mm -hmm. near, near her house down here. That's all in our proposed do not disturb zone. So those are areas where there's existing puddles. Those puddles would remain. We're not adding water to them. We're not taking water away from them either. Uh, but that's all located within the do not disturb zone. The, the water resource committee letter uh, that was just handed to me, uh, the 400 foot setback, we discussed this at the last meeting. But I believe that the, uh, uh, the board presented to us that you wanted the septic system outside the 400 foot and that's what we did. We moved the septic system outside the 400 foot um, setback. <clears throat> Within the 400 foot setback, there were no state regulations or no town regulations that prevent cutting or a roof area or, or grading at all. Uh, let alone the real setback is only 200 feet. We talked about moving the septic system outside the 400 and we did that. We complied with what was requested of us at the last meeting. We were not asked to move the entire building and all of the grading um, outside of the 400, but we did move the septic system as requested by this board. Um, Where's the 400 foot line on that drawing? Sure. So. Four hundred feet is is essentially right here at the face of the building on lot eight. Okay. So this this piece of the property here. But again, there's no restrictions on um, clearing. The restriction is is that the town of Situa has a one hundred and fifty foot do not disturbance zone uh, to a tributary to the reservoir. We greatly exceed the one hundred and fifty foot. Do not disturb zone. Um, and we got the system more than two times the requirement away from the reservoir. 100% uh, of the roof area is being recharged into dry wells, so that hasn't changed. That's been the case all along. 100% of the roof area. Uh, the Water Resource Committee's previous correspondence, I believe, addressed that. Um, So what is it that Water Resources Commission asked? They said provide the impervious cover of the dwellings and roof infiltration system that remain within the 400 foot area. So I realize you were just handed this 
I think we were too. So. The, sure. Uh -huh. So the water, the water resource committee has has one regulation essentially with respect to impervious land area, and that is that if a lot exceeds 15 percent of impervious area, you need to recharge anything beyond that 15 percent mark. All of these lots are under that 15 percent area. They're all two acre lots, and we provide recharge throughout the site, anyways. So. Uh, there's not a problem with, with any compliance with any of their regulations. I had documented that previously in correspondence that we had submitted. So I'm glad. So to you're saying they have the that. answer to this already? You you do in your correspondence and previous letters. I've been providing um, the Water Resource Committee with all the correspondence. She got she got the latest drawings that were unpeer reviewed. And she got the latest set of drainage calculations, which are unpeer reviewed as well. Okay. And we have um, our consultant here this evening. Yes, he is. If you would care to comment, sir. Sure. Uh, Peter Cumberry <coughs> from Merrill Engineers and Land Surveyors. Um, the, uh, we did receive the revised plans, I think it was yesterday or the day before, maybe it's Monday. Um, and um, we haven't had a chance to review them. We did review their response letter. Based on their response letter, they've addressed all our comments, but I can't, I can't say, say that they have because I haven't looked at the plans. Um, in our previous report, we had uh, expressed questions or raised questions about um, the temporary sedimentation basins as part of the erosion control plan. Um, it looks like they have modified them, but again, I haven't checked the calculations at all. And, and then the other thing we had asked for, I think the major thing was um, we felt strongly that there should be drainage easements for any area that's going to be subject to flows. Um, again, based on our, our review of the quick review of the plans, it looks like they're on the plan. But again, I haven't really got into the plans yeah. yet. So, um, I, I, I have a, I just have a question on that. Um, who would the easement? Which, be excuse me, to? excuse me. Okay. Would you direct your sure. comment to me and uh, identify yourself? Sir, sure. Attorney Vincent O'Brien. The question was, uh, and I heard about this today, a drainage easement. And, and that's fine. Who who would the easement be granted to? Who who would the easement? Who would be the beneficiary of the easement? The town. I mean, the property's in a condominium, so the condominium owns all the property, so they can't grant an easement to themselves because they own it. So I, I didn't know if he wanted an easement to the town or to some other entity to the DPW. Or can't grant I an easement. To be, I think it would be an easement to the town. Basically, right of access to. Okay. Um, I'm not sure, and it wasn't really clear to me, to be with it, that this was all going to be one condominium association. Okay. And if it's one total association, then I guess an easement to somebody else wouldn't be necessary. But I think That's all the I was. town um, should have the right to be able to enter if there is a problem. That, that's and also, I, I, and I haven't seen an easement language, but. Um, I think it's important that it specifies that these areas aren't disturbed. You know, you can't make a garden out of it. Mm -hmm. it basically, has to be uh, remain in its natural state. That that's why I in I've seen um, you know easement to the town that the town has the right to enter if if the association is not doing what they're supposed to do, and then the town can build the association. That's what I wanted to clarify. That if that's the case, then it's sort of like they have the right to enter to reasonably inspect with notice. And if for some reason the association is not doing their job, the town can force them to do their job. And if the town does it, then they can assess the, the association for that maintenance. So that's, I just want to clarify who was being granted to, and that, that makes sense. I've seen that in a number of mm -hmm. uh, subdivisions, for example, or something along those lines. Yeah. Well, I, think, I think that just gives us sort of the, the last oh. stop, right? Okay. right? If somebody's really torn up, and I've seen this happen, in town where they've completely eliminated the design of the swale or whatever by somebody modifying you know the property halfway through the swale or something and that makes sense and that's uh, why I wanted to get clarification so that I, I can I can prepare a draft of that um, once I see the plans all right anything else no, that was We're all, set. Yes. all right I'll open it up to the board start with Bill sure Start with Bill. Um, driveway number one, you, you say you moved the driveway, what, 50 feet? About 50 feet shorter, correct. Okay. Wait, what did that do, if anything, to the slope? No. 
nothing, the slope of the driveway, um, the whole cul-de-sac slid a little bit closer to the street. Okay. Um, it just allowed a greater setback to the properties to the west. And they gave increased the amount of space around the, the units? Yes, it moved them closer to Route 3A, mm -hmm. um, but they do comply with the 100-foot setback, which is the requirement. Mm -hmm. And you put it to catch basins on the other ones. Where, where, where do they go to? Sure. Proposed catch basins uh, right here. That catch, this catch basin here, discharges into this four bay into a rain garden. We put a catch basin here, which discharges into a foil separator, and then into the rain garden system here. And and up top on the on the highest driveway we put a catch basin to a four bay to the rain garden. So there are three catch basins. Okay. Is that all domino down the hill? It, it does. Correct. So that the the catch basins you're talking about sort of in the middle and in the far I guess yes, that's so west or whatever are are getting bigger and bigger because they're collecting more? Correct. It's also put in there for you know re redundancy efforts. Each of these systems, this one, this one, and this one, by by themselves comply with the the 90% TSS removal that's in the district. But this also acts as a triple redundant system here. That you know, if there ever was a problem, you know, with the stormwater here, it has to go through two down gradient systems like mm -hmm. this. Um, same with this one, it has to go through. So how does that work? Let's, sure. let's so, pick the 100-year storm. What happens in a 100-year storm? Sure, in the 100-year storm, this, this rain garden here ultimately fills up. It overtops. There's a riprap outlet spillway here. The way that the grading is, this water here is directed. It's over land flow um, and gets collected in this depression here, which then goes through a pipe under the driveway over to this depression. This depression here fills up. There's a rip wrap spillway again it's <coughs> down to a depression on the uphill side of this driveway through a pipe under the driveway into this depression which ultimately discharges to a rip wrap which then discharges over the land so in the hundred year storm all of these basins are overtopping basically is Correct. that how it's designed And and then, how much goes like into infiltration versus, you know, over land? I guess. <coughs> so, all of the roofs go into the infiltration systems, um, which are separate from these. Which are separate. So all the roofs have <coughs> spout gutter systems on them. Mm -hmm. and each of the lots has a minimum of sixteen, up to I believe a maximum of twenty-four leaching chambers for each lot um, so all that water is infiltrated into the ground um, in our drainage calculations we provided <coughs> the runoff in the volumes for the one the two 10 25 and 100 year storm events mm -hmm. and in all storm events we're discharging less water um, uh, in the post condition than in the precondition um, to the down gradient lot line um, Bill, had you finished? Do you have anything else that you want to talk about? No, not right now. <coughs> okay. Got it. Um, I want to defer all my water questions to Mr. Prince and Mr. Bornstein. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more. deferring all my other questions to Patty, though. Okay. Uh, okay, Rebecca, do you have anything? So, the septic system that was moved. It's now it seems far from the building and maybe I'm wrong by looking at it over there is how is it everything getting over to that septic system sure so the, the septic system has a, has a septic tank yeah. um, next to the septic tank is a pump chamber okay. and it's then it gets chamber. pumped yep. over um, there were all six bedroom septic designs all of the lots each of the units are three bedroom units right okay thank you all right um I'll open it up to the public. Oh, Ben. Oh, sorry. Uh, 
Um, since the last iteration of the plan, though, sorry, has there been, I know things have moved around, but has there fundamentally been any changes to the limit of uh, clearing that you know of? So the, the limit of clearing was shifted up the hill on lot eight, which is the most down gradient, because we pulled the septic system up the hill. Sure. And then the buffer along the western lot line to the abutters, that used to be a 20-foot vegetated buffer. We now have proposed as a 40-foot vegetated buffer. So do you have any like estimate of the percent increase now and sure. so increase of land? The, the green space, the undisturbed land area, um, is approximately 60% of the site at this point. It used to be 55% of the site. Okay, so since the last time I saw it, it was about 5%. So it's about 5% delta. Um, the other question I had is um, that I brought up last time is with the water concerns that we've discussed is uh, I brought up is that I'm concerned about out of an abundance of cost, caution, evaluating whether there's anything that could be defined as an intermittent tributary of the water supply. And I had kind of requested that perhaps a site survey by a hydrogeologist or water resource engineer be conducted. I was wondering if that had been conducted or if it's planned. Sure. I reached out directly to the Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP, to a hydrogeologist that's familiar and has done work in situate there. Um, I requested that this board would like if he would do a site visit at this case. Um, I also referred him to the existing DEP file numbers. The DEP hasn't reviewed this specific site, but they have reviewed extensively the TAC factory pond with the expansion of the reservoir and the heightening of it. Um, Mr. Bauk, Bruce Bauk is his name, the hydrogeologist, he didn't think it was necessary to come to this site. He was comfortable with what he had seen. Um, hmm. I had CC'd Karen on those emails requesting him to come. Ben, are you also? Um, the last thing is just a comment on a question, uh, which is that I think we all know, I don't want to sound cynical or negative, but we all know what happens to stormwater operations and maintenance plans um, once every, everyone moves in and, you know, things are, the, the, the builders are gone, the engineers are gone. Um, and we also know what happens during the construction phase when you have contractors that are just used to doing general site work and don't really understand the nuance of constructing infiltration systems and things like that. I think that the construction specifications for the stormwater infrastructure and the operations and maintenance plan needs to really be dialed in and overseen um, throughout the life of this project. That's just a comment. Very good comment. Okay, I'm going to defer to the public at this point in time. Anyone with a comment? Yes. Is there going to be any drainage on the back part of the property or just the ones out front? So all of the driveway areas drain to the drainage systems at the front of the lot. But there's no the, drainage in the back? No, there's not. I just think um, with the last plan a while ago, I know they said it was approved or whatever. They were going to do the big burn with all the water down at the bottom of the hill because that's where it's going to end up, I'm sure. Um, and then the Water Resource Committee, <coughs> that's when they were concerned that it would be making a tributary to the pond. My concern is just the water coming down in the slope. I mentioned the slope before. Yeah, I had wondered myself, and thank you for bringing that up. There does not appear to be anything in the back in terms of this is just going to slide off the, the property to the pond? Correct. That's what it does now in its current right. condition. Okay. That's what it will continue to do. And how high are the mounted septic systems? Septic systems are required to be four feet above the groundwater. Typically on this site, groundwater is about two to three feet below the ground surface. So you're bringing in fill around the septic systems. Uh, septic systems are coming out of the ground anywhere from three to five feet. And so what about basically runoff from these mounds, if you will, that will just flow into the back of the property and then down? Correct. It'll flow uh, 
it'll all flow in a southerly direction toward the tap factory pond. Water doesn't run across the contours, across the lot line. It's going to run in a southerly direction perpendicular to the contours. Yes. Um, the water does flow down there. I remember the last house there on um, Old Forge used to show like a river. Um, and it is the natural flow, but with this type of everything that's going to go on in there, then you're going to have to worry about pollutants and whatever is going to drain off. Anyone else? Could I, could I ask Peter a question here? Does the, I mean, you've looked at the original calcs on this. Yeah. Um, what it, what has been the sort of before and after flows on that section? Do you do you remember? Well, I, I don't specifically remember the, the flows per area per se, mm -hmm. but um, the calculations do satisfactorily demonstrate that. Um, it's not additional it's flow. It's not additional. It's it's less of volume and rate. Mm -hmm. Um, all of the paved areas are going to the closed drainage system and going into the ranch guides and so on. So um, anything that is um, going un untreated, if you will, is going overland. And again, it's less than um, the existing condition. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi, Becky Mellon, I think you that road. Um, I just wanted to clarify the comments that I provided. I realized they were last minute. I just got the plans yesterday. Um, so I chaired the Water Resources Commission. Um, and it seemed the septic system moved as an acknowledgement of the 400 foot buffer. There are some additional requirements that we're going to consider to have factory pond the surface water supply and not just a tributary. Um, and one of the reasons I asked for the impervious cover of what remains in that section is because the impervious cover requirement is different for zone A than for the Water Resource Protection District. I believe it's a maximum of 20% even if there is artificial recharge. That's why I asked for that. Um, and that swale drains downhill towards, towards the buffer, that larger buffer zone. And as, a, um, as it um, mitigates pollutants, that's not the word I was looking for, but you know, will that, could, is there a concern if it's not maintained well over time, that that could become a, a source of uh, pollution, and that's why I requested moving that within the plunge and the buffer as well. And which swale is that? There's a swale right at the <coughs> end of Hot uh, Gate, excuse me. Here. And it drains that way. Oh, coming off of the, uh, the spreader there, yes. or whatever that is. I see. Can you give me a two-minute tutorial on how, how I design a rain garden? Sure. A rain garden essentially is a uh, detention basin that's specifically designed with plantings in it to, for nutrient uptake. Um, it has berms on either side of it as a detention basin. Wood. It has an inlet. Um, in this case here, it's a um, pipe that's bringing water in from the catch basin, uh, but it's made specifically to have plantings in it. Um, as opposed to being a, a bone surface. Okay, and then and I, the feed that, is, that goes into that rain garden is the same as it would go, would look the same when I, I look at uh, the roof, the roof drains, then the other drains that go into it? So the, um, so it's the catch basins that are feeding the rain gardens. The roof drains um, are all subsurface drywall systems okay. so those don't feed in and it looks like the um, I'm just following up on Bill's mm -hmm. comment here but it looks like if you sort of think about the single point of failure on these things it's the pipes under the driveway right so if if the pipes get clogged or covered then it's going to change the the water flow basically and move it out towards the highway right no no actually if the pipes get clogged the water would back up in that upgradient depression. And when you come in off of Route 3A, mm -hmm. uh, we have a negative pitch onto the site. We're not allowed to discharge water onto Route 3A. So the, the depression would fill up, it would overtop the road and then flow across the road to the depression as opposed to running subsurface through the pipe. 
Uh, the piping all has been designed, though, to be under a, under a driveway. Will that be part of the maintenance plan to make sure that leaves and whatever else is? Um, it is. Okay. Yeah, that would be my concern with it is that um, over time you don't end up getting flow yeah. through those pipes. How big are those pipes? I they're 12 inch. <laughs> 12 inch. If, if I may comment on that for a oh, second. Yeah. It's, easy, it's also easy, Steve, you can spec in uh, inlet grates at the at the so you're not actually getting large debris going into the pipe and then as part of your OM you do trash clean out and get everything before it even goes on the pipe and I'd say the main thing is not the pipe backing up but sedimentation of the rain garden itself so fine sediments block the infiltration capacity of the engineered soil that's supposed to go in there so then you're not you're effectively clogging up your your drain which is your rain garden right um, and that's an important part of OM which is spilling sure. over to the pipes right and that's why um, Mr. Morris has incorporated things like the rip wrap and things like that to catch mm -hmm. sediment before it gets in, but it's also imperative that those things are checked periodically but and they're, cleaned they're out. Visual they're, you up. Can, they're visual and you can see them. Yeah. 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 But to Ben's but point, are inlet grates specified here? I have no idea. We were, we were asked to put flared in sections on. So there's no inlet grates here. So if you want them, I would, would ask for them. Well, what do you well, think? I, I think that um, it would depend on how small an inlet grade you want. I, I suggest the flat end sections because I think it makes a smooth transition into a side slope. Um, the downstream end of these pipes also has a sediment uh, forebay, which again is an open body, and the primary function of that is to trap sediment mm -hmm. fines before it gets into the rain gap. So I think that um, I think. The flay down section, the sediment four bay will provide the uh, uh, areas for the sediment to basically settle out, mm -hmm. and that's exactly what you want to happen. Mm -hmm. um, unless you were to put very fine grates on the upstream side, um, you're not going to you're not going to trap um, you're not going to get a uh, trap all the fines on the upstream side, and the converse of that is then you plug it up, yeah, and then you may have the grass swales overtopping. And Greg was right based on the grading. If those grass swales on the, I'll say the northerly side of each driveway um, overtop, they're going to go across the driveway and then back into the sediment four bay, back into the rain garden. So I think. Um, so they won't go out towards three A. That, that's correct. Okay. Okay. And I think the grate we were that I was thinking of was more sort of a gross level for leaves and branches and all that <coughs> stuff. Not this. I don't think you're ever going to put a grate in there that captures yeah. sediment, probably. Um, well, you could add that, but again, it's like anything else; it's a maintenance. Right. Um, you could also have something more like a um, overflow structure, which is flat on the top, and have the water kind of cascade into it. But again, it's it's a maintenance issue. It is all about the maintenance. Exactly. All about the maintenance. Um, there's, there's many ways you can do it. Okay. And well, the visible, the visible issue is if you're the homeowner and it backs up, then you're going to do the maintenance to clear it, right? I would hope so. Yeah. yeah. Would only hope. So that, yeah, that's usually, why I'm thinking maybe a great makes some sense here. Most people, particularly if you're a homeowner, and you see, see something that may um, jeopardize your house or your mm -hmm. driveway or whatever, you, you want it fixed. You'll take yeah. care of it, even if it means walking in the water and removing the debris. Mm -hmm. and most people do do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Lauren McCormack, 21 Stars. I was just curious, so is the Condominium Association that will be in charge of the maintenance of this system? Yes. And so when someone's buying their condominium, they realize like all the... Yes. And they will pay... They get the O&M. only one of the... One of them it will be po the developer common will responsibility though hmm? it's a common responsibility yes for the condo owners okay. <clears throat> so they have dues and um, <coughs> setting aside money every month yes. supposed to yes so we'll in charge of like making sure that happens the condo, the um, condo board the board <laughs> okay so the homeowners basically right, right. 
You know all about that. Yeah. Just like your septic system, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, when I was talking about the bottom <coughs> stretch where um, I said that the water study would say that they're creating a tributary, um, the people that were doing the, that last plan said that the rain gardens wouldn't work on the hill. And it's very challenging to have something on the slope. You know, it, it looks okay on paper because it looks flat. You know what I'm saying? So, that's all. Could you comment on that? Well, they're designed to be flat on the bottom. So, I mean, it, the way they're achieving it is they're, they're cutting in, the slope is like this. I don't know how to really explain it easily, but the slope is like this. They're creating the berm, then they're cutting in, they're making a flat area, then they're basically making a slightly steeper slope on the uphill side. So based on the design plans, they will be flat. The, the rain gardens themselves will be flat. Okay. All right. And hopefully they've come a long way since, what was that, 2007? Any other members of the public? Okay. Have a comment? All right, we have to review everything and come to a meeting of the miser. Our Do we want to get them to opine on this, this mounding analysis and stuff? Right. Yes, and I mean, I guess maybe you just got this note they did. as well. Okay. Yeah, they just right, got it today. We'll, I guess we'll so you will respond to the mounding issue and all that and let us know. So we're going to continue this public hearing. Do we have a day, Karen? Well, I mean, I guess that depends on uh, how much work does the board think is really necessary to complete the project, and are you are you wanting to have a decision at the next meeting? My well, other one other concern that I have: there will this is not a 55 and older condominium association and thank you for that because I personally don't care for them but that said where are these children going to play will there be areas for them to play so there's a, there's a total of 16 units here yeah some of them are going to be more conducive to a young family than other units um, you know these units here these have rather significant large flat backyard areas um, this, these units here, you could easily put a playground up in the backyard of each of those units and not have any issue. Same goes for these two units. Uh, nice big flat backyard, essentially. This backyard here is about 30 feet in depth. Um, flat backyard. This here is approximately 60 feet off the back of these two units. That's a flat area there. Um, so yeah, there's absolutely room okay. to uh, fit a playground on several of the units there. Okay. And so you're going to keep as many trees in the area as absolutely possible? Everything that you see in dark green there, that's our limit of work. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to leave as many trees uh, as possible <coughs> around the perimeter of the site, uh, along the entire frontage, along the green belt. And we have proposed some plantings in between the units and some additional plantings between the units and the abutters to the west um, to help enhance that 40-foot vegetated buffer. All right. Do we have a date? I, it depends on when they're going to get. Are they going to get it? Are you going to get us another set of revised drawings, or do you want Peter Palmieri to review the drawings that were submitted the other day? Sure. It, that, that's the first question because mm -hmm. then that depends on when, if you, if the board wants to proceed with a draft decision. Okay. Well, let's talk about when we're going to get all this review done. Are you so we submitted revised plans that we think address all of Peter's outstanding comments. I believe I can address through letter format the comments made by the Water Resource Committee in the mounting analysis. I think we comply with those requirements. I'm confident we comply with those. Um, so I'd like to review the plans that we previously submitted. Okay. I, I just want to comment, um, and again, I haven't looked at the plans, but I would, I would just... Um, Ask Greg to double check the erosion control plan to make sure 
everything is going to get to temporary sedimentation basins and the basins are, are adequately sized and they have some sort of an outlet. Um, For construction you talk about? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, cause I, for this site, it's extremely important. Yes, absolutely. And also to the um, condominium docks, will you have those for our review? We already, we, we, we've, we've had, had them once. I yeah. mean, we've had them once, and I haven't sent them back out for review. But, I mean, they got town council's comments the okay. first time right. around. So I'll have to re-review re -review them to see if they need strengthening. Okay. Ba but based on the input from this week. I mean, I guess if the board wants, we have time, 9 o'clock on February 13th. Otherwise, uh, February 27th, it wouldn't be till like 9.30. Oh, 9.30, no. Nothing good happens after 9. <laughs> and will we be able to get your feedback from the Water Resources Commission as well? Yeah. Okay. And I think that's dependent on maybe getting some the information that you've requested, right? Okay. So, the 13th at 9? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I move to accept the applicant's request to continue the public hearing for the common driveway special permit in stormwater for 443-461 Chief Justice Country Highway until February 13, 2020 at 9 p.m. and continue the time for action for filing with the town clerk until Part February 28th. 228. 2020. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. I think I'm going to have a comment if there's anything else. All right. Great. Um, Quick question. Uh, the piece that I didn't understand, I'm still not sure that I understand. All right. Um, I'm, I know how the water gets in, but I don't know whether, that, whether it should Second. be a 30 by 30 All or favor. 30 by 50. Aye. Thank you. Fine. We have, um, let's do approved minutes. We have to wait till 9 o'clock to do that. So. Uh, I move to approve the me meeting minutes for January 9th, 2020. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Accounting. I move to approve the requisition of $400 to horseman written roofing for peer review services of 14 to 16 Old Country Way Definitive Subdivision Plan, $200 to horseman written in for peer review services for One Buck Eye Lane and Starkbridge Definitive Subdivision Plan, for $2,979.20 to horse and written group inc for the peer review services associated with seaside Accenture phase one. For $2,586 to horse and written group for peer review services associated with seaside Accenture phase two. Is there a second? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do they have to work for anybody else? <laughs> okay. Um, let's see, liaison reports. Um, I attended Zoning Board of Appeals last week because I had to go before them for something I'm doing on my property, but um, Bob Vogel was presenting the repair, reconstruct, um, uh, by proposed bylaw change to, to the Zoning Board, and there wasn't really subs very much substantive comment on the actual text and meat of the bylaw, but the board kind of came to consensus that they want the authority to issue the, that only by special permit. So kind of similar to what we were talking about, about in those cases where this, you know, where it goes beyond. Is, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Would be like reviewed by a special permit. And we had said maybe it would be us. The zoning board said it should be, they, I mean, I didn't really bring up the, the planning board. I was just kind of observing, but um, they were thinking similar, but they specifically said the zoning board of appeals should have the authority to, issue that by special permit. So Bob was going to go back to the drawing board and, and kind of tweak what he had come up with. So we'll see. 
Yeah, if I could follow up on that. Bob, is, Bob told me the zoning board thought that the language should be a lot simpler. And so he's going to take another stab at it and then get it to, I think, us and then get it back to the zoning board. So in light of, for all that process to occur, we're postponing. We're not going to advertise for that public hearing until February 27th when you're going to have your sign bylaw hearing as well. So we'll just have one zoning public hearing now pushing off so that the zoning board gets to weigh in a couple times on what Bob is writing because they are going to actually be the sponsor of that article. But you still have to have the public hearing um, and make a recommendation. We do if they're sponsoring it, don't yeah. they? Yeah, because you have to, it's mass state law, zoning has to have a public hearing before the planning board. And, and, and you have to do a report at town meeting. And so, just so I understand the sort of the distinction here, I'm not sure I understand why it would go to a zoning board of appeals or a planning board for a special permit. What's, what's the, uh, uh, what was the sort of logic on that? Well, because, because they already have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals for, for those two sections anyways, so the special permit should be through the Zoning Board of Appeals. For, for what two sections? For um, Section 830 and 810. They already have to go there. So if there's going to be something that needs another special permit, it still should be the ZBA as mm -hmm. the permit granting authority. Okay. Well, that, may, that would be more efficient anyway. Right, it would okay. be. I get that. Um, the only other thing I have is, uh, as many of you are, the Master Plan Advisory Committee will be meeting on this coming Tuesday uh, at the library at 6.30. I think. Yeah. I'll send out a reminder. Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking with the consultant team tomorrow to hopefully come up with some semblance of a, an agenda or set some goals for the meeting. So I'll try to pass that along probably Monday or tomorrow afternoon as well. And then um, on that front, I'm also, we've, Karen and I have been in touch with the middle school principal. I, I brought this up once before, but they still are trying to do this civics engagement thing with the seventh grade where we have one session that's about the planning and master planning and then another one where we actually take solicit student input. So we're kind of, we're, we're kind of left with, with, with Brad leaving with a little bit of a void. So I'm trying to catch up, but it would be great if any other members of the board would be interested in helping with that effort because we're going to need to probably put together a presentation and figure that out. So um, just if anyone's interested in that. Um, I'll help. All right, I'll, put, I'll, send, I'll send an email to, to the group, um, and then we can figure out and start talking with Ryan because it looks like Ryan's the principal. Um, it looks like... Um, it looks like because we're have, because the teachers have to put in the lesson plan and everything, it kind of like it's kind of slow. They can't just do it at the last minute, so we'll probably have to be farther out sometime in February at this point. But um, I'll just let I'm trying to just keep them let them know that we're still interested. So figure that out. All right, um, CPC met last Monday night. Uh, we have the Union Mission Chapel is looking for funds to redo their heating system. It's a non-denominational facility. But there is this whole idea, and somebody's supposed to be checking on the separation of church and state, but it really, it, it's, it's not a church per se. It goes back to 18-something. It is a historic building, and unless they fix the heat, we're going to lose it. Which one is that? It's out on Old Oak and Bucket Row. Oh, near the intersection there? Yes. Oh, that's right. Kind of right. right in the town line. Right. 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 And it's been around forever. And the other... Who owns it? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Why aren't they maintaining it? That's, that would be my first question. But they can't... We, it's just a... It's a non-denominational group that just doesn't have any money, I guess. They, they picked it up in church, but originally it was a meeting hall. Right. Right for it's right at the split there, right? Yeah. Yeah. But originally it was a meeting hall, and that's how I think we ended up putting money into it before. Yes. We the town. C yeah, we being CPC. Oh, oh really? And this is all under the sort of historic preservation yes. component. Yeah. Yes. The other big item that we have, and it's big, is um, purchasing 
for $900,000 the Mordecai Lincoln property, which is just under five acres, overlooks the Gulf River. Nicest view in town. The best, one of the best views in town. There are three buildings on the property. The big issue is who is going to maintain it, and that's something that will be dealt with. Um, the first goal is to buy it because the last thing we need is to um, have it developed into mega houses. I would say you should resolve the maintenance when you buy it, not afterwards. Well, there are two houses on the property. One will be somebody lives there already and he will stay there and he will maintain, mow the lawn and do all of that. And then the other house will ultimately be rented out as well, and the funds coming from that will. Yeah, I just think you know, been through a lot of, a lot of uh, acquisitions of open space, and if you don't have a maintenance plan going in, it never shows up after you buy it. Right. So, but I think we don't want to let this one get by us. We really don't. No, I'm just saying, you know, do it all at one time. Okay, that's what I have. Well, I went to Board of Health, and it was the most lively Board of Health meeting I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, it was very Do contentious. Tell. It was really? very contentious. It had to do with uh, grease traps. With what? Grease traps and yeah. restaurants. And uh, the man who owns Crust is uh, challenging his fines. Now, wait a minute. Which restaurant? Crust? It used to be Riva Pizza. Riva Pizza. Pizza. Okay, okay. Up in Tiff uh, Next mm -hmm. no, to Sean Harris's. Yeah, yeah. apparently he got, he got fined, and he had a late notice, and there's no... Um, we don't have any set rules, and who says how deep the grease trap? It, it was, like I said, kind of exciting. I, I hate to say this, but I think he knew a little more than the person running the meeting. Um, so it went on for like almost two hours. Wow, this went on. So uh, I, I think that there's going to be some. Uh, they're going to have to go back and look at their um, language about how deep a grease trap is supposed to be, and how often you're supposed to remove stuff. And there was. Lots of dangling stuff left out that they kind Isn't of. Isn't that all in the up. building code? Crease traps? Comes out of, it comes out of the Board of Health. I would think the original design of a grease trap is covered in the building code, right? But well, that was maybe. one of those loosey goosey things that nobody really right. could answer. <laughs> uh, the sewer department makes comments on a project, too, that, yeah. you know, the grease trap has to be, you know, uh, yeah. functionally inspected, etc. Yeah. So apparently this grease trap had not been inspected for seven years Whoa. before this man bought it. So that's, that's why we're in contention about how come it's all my fault and how come nobody else had to deal with it before. Well, that's the point. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, let me interrupt you. It is now 9 o'clock. Okay. We have a um, public hearing for an accessory dwelling, 755 First Parish Road. So I move to accept the applicant's request to continue the public hearing for the special permit accessory dwelling for 755 First Parish Road, map block lot 30-2-18 until March 12, 2020 at 7.15 p.m. and to continue the time for action for filing with the town clerk until March 27, 2020. Is there a second? Yep. All in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. All right. Back to where we were. That's it. Second that's in the it. grease. Huh? That, that's it for the grease. I mean, that's that's a slippery slope. Uh, like I said, yeah, it really wasn't. He was not happy. <laughs> I went to the housing trust. Oh, how was that? Good. They're just really trying to get their plan. Uh, they sent out bids to get the because they need a new update their plan, and um, they got their bids in and. They've selected the yeah, consultant, and we've uh, we've sent the contract out. So all she needs to do is sign it. It's Karen Sonnerborg. She's the one who did the last two housing production plans. And what about uh, Lawson Green? Should they talk about that? No. no. Oh, they, I didn't stay for that. They were at TPA the other night, oh. but I, I don't know why. And they were bought a as well. They're tied up in paperwork. It's kind of a long, arduous journey. I think that the closing that. is in the next day or so. It's, it's eminent. It's eminent. Okay. So they're kind of working out, my understanding is they're kind of working out the funds, how they're getting money to get the 
escrow and banks and yeah. those kinds of things. So they're they're trying to flush that out. But because one point two, I think, is coming from CPC. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know how the money transfers, but it's kind of just trying to figure out how money is transferring from right. one place to another place. It's always about and the money. And then final, you know, review of documents. There's a couple of items. All right. Um. It's like mass plumbing code is where you go for that. <laughs> <laughs> just to, just in case you want to know. Oh, okay. All right. Um, let's have a quick discussion about the proposed sign bylaw amendments. Everybody have a chance to read it. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, it was uh, wonderful. I must admit, I have not so. Forty seven lashes. We read it and read it again. So I um, talked with Judy today and I decided that she um, not to do one round of comments until after we I heard from the board tonight because I got some comments from the uh, building department and I had a few here myself. Um, a lot of this I went and compared it to what's in our existing bylaw and some of those stuff that a lot of the stuff is the same but she has made this um, try to conform to the case law. Mm -hmm. um, a couple things that um, I wanted changed is on page three um, D sign waivers. Um, that that's the ZBA. It's not planning board. Because Where is this? On page, page three. Mm -hmm. Three. D. 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 The first. The first. Right. Oh, oh, sign oh, waivers. Oh, okay, sorry. Sign wa That's going to be a ZBA because ZBA is special permit granting authority for all other aspects related to uh, signs. Um, under prohibited signs, we're going to take out tethered floating or devices of any kind I have building department feels that that's easier if we just take them all out um, what does that mean when easier what does that mean this is a prohibited sign so they're saying these would not be prohibited right I mean how do you regulate frosty the snowman how do you mm -hmm. regulate um, that kind of stuff it gets to be a little Legs. Um, dicey, mm -hmm. shall we say, with inflatable devices. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly so. You're um, <laughs> they're thinking of that guy that goes up and floats up and down. Yeah. They don't want so that. we're just going to, the building department feels it's just easier if we take it out of prohibited um, devices. Um, in here, they're not going to refer to a sign officer. They're going to just have a building commissioner. Um, we are going to be changing um, on page five the districts um, of coordinating so that um, there is no RM district so that under 710.9 so we're looking at the current zoning map and making sure the districts are all correct um, and a few other minor changes um, that the building department wanted in here um, are reasonable. We're taking out um, gaseous tubing um, since an internally illuminated references because we. Where are you? Um, I'm under definitions. Mm -hmm. We're taking out those because we don't allow them, and so that's going to be. Um, taken out of here. Um, she has to go back and re coordinate the definition under section 200 on sign so that, um, that with this um, with this definition so she will go back and do that before you get another before you get another draft but if anybody has any comments if you could get them to me so that then we can have another another draft where she incorporates all your comments, building department's comments. Um, you know, so I'd like to have probably a quick discussion at the next meeting because we'll be advertising. The advertising's going to be due the next day. Um, 
or if not before then. But the advertising is going to be general, you know, uh, change section 200, replace, delete the entire section 710, add a new section 710. I mean, so. Um, I've got a question on 10.4C. Um, if you're worried about inflatable, mm -hmm. it's saying revolving, moving, flashing. Mm -hmm. All I can think about is those new Christmas things that move all over the place. You know, you just put them in front of your house. It's a little. Oh yeah. yeah. But is that a sign? Well, that's not a it, sign, though, is it? It's not. A, it's not a sign. But if you're worried about frosty that someone's got, oh, just because that says inflatable devices. Right. The other one had inflatable devices, which is uh -huh. what a lot of okay. those are, and so that's why we decided. Well, those are signs, though. Well. Like right. a Christmas but, but, decoration but I, I, is a sign? No, but that's... They, they don't want somebody to interpret that as a sign, which a sign is not just something with, um, with, le with lettering on it. It could be a picture. So to make sure that there's no, you know, no chance of misconstruing, the building department just thought it would be better to take it out. And, and Judy they, doesn't have a problem. Judy kind of agrees. Okay. And so do we not have to um, It seems like you have to take all these provisions out. Um, those lights that, uh, those flashing ones that tell you how fast you're going? Hate those signs. <laughs> you know uh, those Or the one the public safety. Well, so that's, that's actually. Text that goes. The, no, so that's excluded in C, except for signs which display public service information, oh, okay. right. such as time and temperature, but I would assume it would also say. <laughs> Maybe it's someplace else, I don't know. But you know the ones I'm talking about that actually say how fast you're going, that's different than a traffic light. Right? Right, traffic so control are, signs. It's yeah. an exempt sign. It's exempt. It's actuated okay. flashing that's, beacons that's on the yeah. pedestrian yeah. thing. Okay, okay, thank you. Seven, I'm concerned about um, D, 710.4D, feather banners, or, or you know, that, I don't know that ribbons, means. streamers, spinners. We have. Let's face it, there aren't any prohibited signs, right? Right, I'll take that out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can make the case for anything Sorry. that would be. You know, an exemption to the prohibited signs. So then the question is, why do we have prohibited signs? signs? So you can't have one of those wind suckety things that, I mean, I don't want to have them. But is that what that's referring to? Or is it referring to something else? I'm not sure where this list came from. So is it in our current regs? No, it's not in our current regs. It's, it's um, what she's been working on pretty much standardly throughout the state. So you want me to question D? D. Yes. Okay. All right. The signs on parked motor vehicles. Is somebody going to actually enforce that? <laughs> For sale? <laughs> the building commissioner is going to go around and <laughs> eliminate those? I mean... I, you could take this to the nth degree. Nth degree yeah. here, right? If you have any comments, just get them to All me, right. please, okay. sometime next week, so I can get it to her, so we can get another draft. Okay, the, moving rapidly along, appointment of new design review committee member. What is your pleasure, people? Um, I, I would. I like the first year that we did that this year. You like, you like what? Like the first man which you with us. Buckley? Yes, Buckley. I, I think I, I would vouch, vote actually vouch for um, Heather <coughs> Marshall, who... Was she the third person? She was the second. Uh, which was second? One? She was second. And, and Patrice yeah. was the third. There was, it's confusing because uh -huh. they're, I say the architect, but they're all three of them are architects, yeah. so she was the second one. Um, but she... Um, is doing work in town. I have pictures of people working in town. Oh. 
Yeah, I was going to say that the third woman we had, yeah. the third person we had here, I thought she had great credentials. Yes. Obviously, they were all architects. I like the gentleman who was here tonight, but I, I think if if I had to think about it, I'd probably want some kind of architect on the. His expertise is that doesn't fit to our process. Yeah. No. I mean, he he obviously has sort of expertise maybe in sort of managing. Yeah. the process but what we're really looking for is the hardcore we're looking for the yeah. input not managing the right input. we're right. looking for the expertise yeah. right. and who was the, th the third person what was her name uh, Paulette, Paulette uh, O'Connell Paul okay. yeah um, she seemed more than competent um, unfortunately I don't have all the stuff no, from me <laughs> Bill I'm kind of partial towards Buckling. I mean, I think with the exception of the, the last one, and nothing against him, it's just where his expertise lies. Yes. Right, I think they could all, all do a good job. All right. Um, Rebecca? So I wasn't there. I'm not going to make a comment because I wasn't there. Okay. I left early that night. Ben? Um, I mean, I, I like Heather, but I, you know, and be swayed if we need to get a majority, depending. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the reason, I just what, what was the reason um, you all were saying that Heather? Well, were you saying she works in town? Yeah. yeah. Oh, but I'm not. I'm not so sure that Mrs. O'Connell does not work in town either. Right. They both work. They yeah, both I work. I was going to say I've seen her stamp. They both do work. Right. Work okay. in town. Well, right. then I can go with Mr. Buckley. I just like his expertise with the historic stuff in Brooklyn, which obviously I've been there and seen the results of what what he can do. And he works in Boston, not in Situate. He has a BA in philosophy. There you go. Me too. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Well, I, you, you know, I mean, he works in Boston now, I know. right? Right. I mean, it looks like they all, at one time or another, worked in major cities, right? Cambridge, mm -hmm. um, Charleston, yep. Charlestown. Goes with a job. Yeah. Right. I mean, they work for big architectural firms, right? Mm -hmm. So. so my question is if if you sort of put them all together um did everybody have sort of a feeling they both had enough both commercial and residential because residential is is useful in sort of a multifamily environment right yeah. but not as a standalone residential house right yeah. necessarily you know because we don't we don't spend much time in subdivisions looking at the architectural design right of the house Maybe we should. Uh, but we generally look at site plans and, mm -hmm. and all of that. And certainly for, like, Toll Brothers and for um, Drew. Drew, we were looking at commercial, sort of what was more commercial. Or Toll Brothers is like a multifamily sort of commercial design, yep. if you will. So did you feel like everybody had similar sort of experience and expertise in that? Yeah. Yeah, I, it wasn't uncomfortable that I, I happened like Buckley in his, his response to the, what he was talking about historically. He sat there and he said he, he really didn't necessarily have hands on, but this is the, the, his thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, and that made sense to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Ben, you want Heather? Yeah, but I mean, we don't all have to agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Patty. I said Mr. Buckley first. Okay. And Steve. Well, as I said, I think I was kind of with Paulette O'Connell. 
Because um, I thought we're she, all over the place. Yeah, because I thought she had more sort of the commercial architecture sort of background. It, it looks to me like the Heather does too, in terms of um, some of the previous work she did. What do we think about John's so let's background? See what she was then working in town. No, I just think they have to recuse themselves for anything yeah. they're working on. Right? Either that, or they go before the selectmen and they obtain special employee status. Yeah, special employee status. But keep in mind, it's still design review stuff that would go to DRC, which mm -hmm. probably isn't. I mean, they, you know, they might they're, work they're on something that comes to us, like accessory dwellings and stuff. But right. I don't know about. I don't know. No, I like the fact that. You know, his publications, The Greenest Home. I mean, he's into passive house design. Yes, which is where we're, we're trying to. It looks like a lot of, almost all of his experience has been, was in New York. Yeah, he told us that. Right. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with people from New York. No. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not making a value judgment. I'm talking about <laughs> expertise. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> judge it by one city. There was a lady up in Blueberry, Bluebird, Lane, who came back out, and there was a, something before the board, and the board voted the way that she wanted. She's very passionate about it. But the board voted the way she wanted it to go, and she came up and she thanked me. Because she, her biggest fear in life was that people come from New York and try to take over the planning board. And I looked and there was David, myself, I forget, there were, there were four, four of the five members were on the... All from New York. All from New York. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, and, and they're all, are they all registered architects yes. in Massachusetts? Can't tell. These two are. John is and Paulette. He's I'm very assuming Heather, Heather is, is too. But Heather is a registered architect in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts as yes. well. So, I mean, they all sort of have credentials, right? Well, and Buckley's familiar with zoning language and rules, which is a plus. Which kind of surprised me. He said, Well, I read all the bylaws before I moved. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in. I like Buckley. So, when is the next opening? Uh, how about um, Hal Stokes is up in uh, November. in November. So I I don't know how he's feeling right now. We haven't had a design review committee because there hasn't meeting because there hasn't been a project. Mm -hmm. But I think he wavered last time. He what? He, he wavered about re-upping, yeah, and he did. Yeah, he was um, sort of on the fence, I think. Yeah. But there really hasn't been a lot to review at the moment. I, I think that's going to change when we start getting projects in um, for the rest of Greenbush. Um, so I do think it's going to change. And it will change if we do get some teeth for the historic preservation as well, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know if we would send it to the design review committee or we'd send it to the historic committee. And they right? then in turn go back to the It depends on what type of project yeah. you have. Yeah. All right, let's just bring this to a close. Um, gotta make a motion for Buckley. I move to appoint Mr. Buckley to the design review committee. Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 No, I was supporting. I know. Paulette, so nay. Nay. Yeah. Nay. Nay. So it's <laughs> three, three to two. Yeah. It's moved to Buckley. Thank you very much. I would, I would just comment that I think everyone, we had a really good yes, batch of people did. that came I out. Think, and yep. that, um, yeah. I for those that applied, I applaud their. I think Mr. That. Coogan, who was in here to see us the last one, I think he would be great on economic development. Yeah. 
Yep, or Public Buildings Commission. Public Buildings. Public buildings. Lots of yes. Yeah. So. Facilities. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm going to call him myself. All right. Okay. All right. We have um, planning and development. We're busy, busy, busy. Busy, busy, busy. So I told you about the February 25th at the Selectman's meeting. I told you that uh, the email today says the water update study is going to be presented at the Selectman's hearing on the 4th. I told you about the zoning articles, Seaside and Situate. The first occupancy is supposed to be next week. I haven't received a final plan yet with our certification on it, but I'm told it's coming. I've so. been told that there are people working in those buildings at midnight inside. You better not be. The time is 10 o'clock. Nobody's complained. Okay. Nobody's complained on that one. All right. But, but I've been told, I mean, so there better not be. <laughs> Okay. And then I sent them an e I sent them an email tonight saying make sure you're buttoned up for the storm for this weekend because we're anticipating an inch of rain in about eight hours. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully they've swept the streets tomorrow and um, <coughs> they've got the whole pump situation all squared away by now. And you and I'm I hoping can, we will walk um, Townsend on Sunday morning. I mean, and so. Next week we're meeting with, uh, we have a couple meetings, uh, one with uh, Curse of States people, have a meeting um, on, we're still working on stormwater regulations. Um, so um, I have a meeting with Josh Bowes and Amy Walkie, the conservation agent on that before we have one final meeting with the working group and then hopefully uh, this spring we get it to the planning board um, and you'll know that it's been a couple of years worth of work into this um, thing. And uh, senior centers going along. They uh, had pre-construction meeting last week. And, I see uh, they put this the traffic sign up, huh? The speed oh, yeah, I saw that. speed sign. I didn't notice. Yeah, it's up across the street. Okay, I know they ordered one, so it was supposed to go in. I saw um, it tonight. And so. That's kind of where we are. We remain very busy. Next meeting is going to be, we we have a site plan review and two, theoretically two subdivision definitive subdivisions, for the uh, for the zoning freeze, along with. Um, are these justice. definitive subdivisions that don't get built? Yeah. Yes. Is that what's coming out? Did Jeff buy into my suggestion on the? Uh, yes, he did. And so we're working on language on, on that. And um, what, what it says is basically it's a paragraph that sits there and says that even though the thing, the, we're, the certain waivers are made now, that doesn't mean if we don't, if we get additional information in the future that we can withdraw the, withdraw that. Mm -hmm. So if you put that out, then basically it sits there and says whatever follow may or may not ever be. Thanks, sense. Not that I know of at the moment. Please, I mean, no. yeah, you never know what's going to come in in, in Greenbush. <laughs> I mean, well, um, the housing trust, they would just love somehow to find a little more land or another house to put in. Actually, there is a piece of land. How about the old senior center? Yeah, at the corner of Eli and Hadley Road. That a former selectman wanted it, it's owned by the town. He went to the building inspector. It meets all of the setbacks for an affordable unit. And he wanted to do it in conjunction with Habitat for Humanity. But one of the members of the Board of Selectmen said, Oh, well, you know, no, we want that, the money, blah, blah, blah. And it's never been sold and it still sits there. So that is the thought. Why did they, what do they want the money for? 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's a new board. It's, do people change all the time? Maybe no. Oh, go again. No. Um, they want tax revenue. So they want. So it's a smaller. Yes. Oh, they want tax. Revenue. Yeah. yeah, but you know, if you want that, then you sell it. But it hasn't been sold, so it would not impact much of anything. How big is the lot? It is buildable. At Eli Hadley. The corner of Eli and Hadley. Right on the corner. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Where is the Eli? Off of Hadley. That's like, that's like, like well, I know where. Like Hadley. Hadley. So I don't know where Eli. Like if this is Egypt. Past my house. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's Hadley's Country Club. Oh, okay. All right. On the right hand side. Oh, there it is, right there. Huh? Yeah, it's weird. It's like a two yeah. two sided street, so I don't know which yeah, corner they mean. Yeah, one of those isn't. Yeah. Oh. Kind of yeah, but they don't actually connect. I know. Oh no, I know. Yeah. So it's either. Well, you know, Eli, it goes yeah, down to the, to um, the, the water, yeah. but then again, you have to go up Hood Road, and Eli goes in again. Yeah. Right. It's very strange. It's a very strange road. There. Mm-hmm. There's that other lot right around the corner from there that I don't know if it's which one? I don't know that it's actually buildable, but this is what we've talked about. If you could put a smaller house there, or maybe I've talked about in the house trust. Um across the street on Hatherley Road, they put in those three new houses. The big jobs. The big ones, yeah. And there's a small piece. What I just was like snooping around on the assessor's map one day, and I feel like there's a small piece of property back there that they would no one would let them build on. It might be, it might not conform somehow, but maybe if you would put an affordable unit there. Does it have frontage? I'm not 100% hmm. sure about this that. part, like across from Major Beach Park Mall. No. It's, um, it's not there. Okay, I'll entertain Bill's uh, motion. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Sounds off.